Right, when have you ever heard me follow instructions? Um, is there anybody in the room that thinks this trial should have three plus as its endpoints? Howie. It doesn't have three plus, it has two plus. It's less than or equal to two plus. Yeah. So you think moderate MR is okay? That's a win. I, no, I, I think I think it's a I, the, the, yeah. biggest, I, the biggest problem I have is the mix of all the different patients. So I well, let's just focus on the endpoint to start with, and let's yeah. let's accept and I'll. I'll talk about the mix of patients, but let's accept that we are mostly enrolling low-risk patients. Well, if it's a low-risk trial, that's very different. You're enrolling, the, the trial design is low, medium, and high-risk patients. So for an 85-year-old who has degenerative MR and I can get two plus without open heart surgery, I think that's sometimes acceptable. It depends on the patient. And a 66-year-old, maybe not. So, so what, I think it's I mean? hard. Trials are always a compromise of who you're enrolling in the endpoints. I, I will say that. So when I, before I started on this journey of designing a trial, I had, let's just say, respect for Mike Reardon and David Adams and Greg Stone and Saibal Carr and Roxana. It before. took before. <laughs> After two years of sitting in committees and hourly calls with interventionists and trialists and non-invasive cardiologists and surgeons, coming up with what we felt was really a design that was acceptable to us all, that we'd sort of sweated blood over and you emerge into sort of the open air and you present it to your colleagues and they throw rocks at you. I, I now have profound and deep respect. And it's a shame that it took that whole two year process to really understand quite how challenging it is to design a trial. And my first and foremost thought is to agree with every single slide that David Adams just showed, one. Two, with the premise, I completely agree this is all about the patient. And three, there's not one cardiologist in this room that would keep sending me patients if my patients left the OR with two plus MR, period. And there's a whole lot that would look pretty disappointed if my patients left the OR with a one plus MR and then in like two years time developed two plus MR. That, that's not how surgeons grow successful mitral valve repair practice because we intuitively know, and I'm sorry there's not robust data, I'll show you what there is that one and two plus is not good for you. One plus turns into two plus in degenerative patients and two plus is not good for you. So I'm not going to say that endpoints for mitral tier trials are okay. I'm gonna reinforce the points that you have just heard. And I have an obvious conflict of interest. So rationale. For anybody who is in any doubt why we need to do this trial, Dr. Herman, um, this is the practice of tear and surgery in the United States today, and this is all etiologies. And we showed this this morning. And for those of you that asked me later, well, hang on a minute, since the US is so regulated, what do those patients actually look like? They are predominantly degenerative patients. That's TVT data. The degenerative patients are predominantly higher risk, but there's a substantial number that are low risk with STS proms below two. 25% of them in 2020 had STS proms below 2%. And those low risk patients are getting tear because we're claiming that they're frail. So 60% of those low risk patients are claimed to be frail and another 30% are claimed to have unusual <coughs> circumstances. And when you drill down into that sort of TBT data form, unusual circumstances is an interesting hodgepodge of reasons. But this really tells you the truth. So this is CMS data, and we have identified degenerative patients because when they change the ICD codes, they identify prolapse. So you can really easily, you don't just have to do it by exclusion anymore. And again, transcatheter modalities in these patients has not increased the patient pool like it did for aortic stenosis. We're not suddenly seeing large numbers of patients that weren't offered operations before. We are intervening on patients that previously were candidates for surgical repair. That is why they are these low risk, frail patients. And two years ago, when we started talking about this trial and we asked 60 interventionists and surgeons, did you have equipoise to randomize intermediate risk patients? The vast majority said yes. So that was the setting in which we started thinking about this trial. And at that point, I think we all thought this was going to be a predominantly intermediate risk trial, but it isn't. The vast majority of the patients, and I'll walk through why, that we're seeing and we're enrolling, we're randomizing, are low risk. So that gave everybody a great deal of pause for thought because obviously we've been through the whole TAVA trial design, which very thoughtfully went from high to intermediate to low risk. And everybody 
was a little concerned that this was an aggressive thing to do. And yet, think about it. You've already seen that low-risk patients are getting tear. Degenerative low-risk patients are getting tear. Don't kid yourselves that they're not. Patients come to the office asking about it. A lot of this is patient-driven. It's not just cardiologist-driven. So clinicians have equipoise. So many patients are interested. We don't have data to have a meaningful conversation with them. And if we wait and do high risk and then intermediate risk and then low risk trials, we will have the answers a little bit too late. And unlike TAVA, which was not a super mature technology, TIR is actually relatively mature. Um, so here are the trials. Everest 2 on the left, primary, which is the NIH, and I think this is really important, this is an investigator-initiated NIH-sponsored trial. It's a rare beast in this space. Repair MR on the right, and then Mitra HR, which is a French trial, which is really just focused one year outcomes, very high risk patients. Repair MR, Cybel is the um, interventional PI on moderate risk, two year outcome, and ours is a minimum for three years follow up for the primary endpoint. Many patients will have five year follow up at the time of the primary endpoint with a built in recalculation if we don't see enough event rates to increase the number of patients to 650. And I think the big sticking point is this composite endpoint that we landed on when we thought we were going to be rolling intermediate risk patients. And this view that a fail was three plus. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the endpoint. Ideally, you design a trial that was driven by important things like death and exactly as you say, how he stroke, that those would be the things that could probably decide this trial. Well, that's just really problematic. Surgical patients in the US, and again, this is the graph that I showed this morning, and if you take one thing away from today, it's this. 0.3% mortality, all comers. You cannot get an appendix done for that. You can barely get a cholecystectomy taken out laparoscopically with that mortality. Surgeons are doing a safe, consistent job. The majority of surgeons have not had an isolated mitral valve repair mortality during the time frame of that study, which was about five or six years of STS returns. And about 50% of hospitals have not had an isolated mitral valve repair mortality. I mean, that, that's just amazing. So that's our benchmark. And remember, the New York State mortality for a mitral clip at 30 days is 3%. And what's the TVT mortality for mitral clip at 30 days? 3%. And what is it in the low risk STS prom patients, 1%? It's 1.7%. They get out of the hospital. You've got 5%, 0.5% in hospital mortality, but at 30 days in low risk patients undergoing tear, it's 1.7%. It's five times that. But if you build a trial around 0.3% versus 1.7%, you're going to have to recruit 10,000 patients to show it. So obviously, mortality is not going to be the sole endpoint. And stroke. Tear data, that's TVT on the left. Surgery data, that's STS on the right. 0.5% versus 1.2%. It's not enough to power a trial. I wish it was, but it isn't. So that's when you have to start looking at more frequent endpoints. And this is where the data gets sketchy because the registries aren't powered and they don't follow up patients in the long term. So this is now CMS data, looking at degenerative patients. Three-year mortality and propensity matched degenerative patients is a 29% versus 12%, that might be enough to inform an endpoint. Three-year heart failure readmission, 17% versus 11%, and mitral valve intervention, 6% versus 1%. Those might be the outcomes. But I think that's why we have to talk about residual MR again. So this is 4,000 patients with degenerative valve disease, stratified survival, blue is no MR, red is mild MR, green is moderate MR, yellow is severe MR, which line do you want to be on? And I know it's just an association, but there is a survival impact, even with mild MR. Can I get that? This is after surgical repair. So this is our group. Um, it's about eight to 10 years of data, 1,000 robotic patients. Generally, when we have mild MR, we go back on bypass and we fix it. Some patients, we've chosen not to do it. We basically compared them, and generally the patients we choose not to do it are sicker, so there's definitely a selection bias. But we've tried to adjust for that, so we've looked at everything clinically that we possibly could, including frailty, bad aortas, long bypass times adjusted for it. There is still a survival impact of leaving a patient with mild MR, and the only predictor of whether a patient needs re-intervention or a re-operation, or died, 
was leaving the OR with mild MR. Mild MR is not good for you in degenerative patients. And here's the impact. This is TVT. This is not published. This is hopefully going to ACC as a late breaker. Here are patients with degenerative disease that had tears stratified by the presence of 2 plus MR. It's not good for you. And unfortunately, you don't see the impact until about three years. The curves only start to split about three to four years out. So the NIH has been very generous, but they're not going to fund a trial for like 15 years to kind of see the survival difference. We, we, we've got money for three to five years and a bit of money left for some 10-year follow-up. This is why you have to look at MR as a surrogate for the clinical endpoints. It's just very difficult to argue otherwise. I might skip over non-inferiority in the interest of time because I think the discussion might be more interesting than the rest of my slides, but suffice it to say, I feel extremely strongly about a superiority design when you're comparing a treatment, as Greg pointed out, that may be less safe than a more safe treatment, because you need to know which one is better. It is, to me, quite inconceivable that a inferior, non-inferiority margin of that side could hide a benefit in patients that are asymptomatic at start with. The only reason they're having a procedure is to improve life expectancy, and yet if we did a non-inferiority design, surgery could basically land there and still tear would be considered non-inferior. That, that just makes zero sense to me. So that's why it's a superiority design. So in summary, we need a lowest trial. Unfortunately, we do need it now. The endpoint does need to shift. I'm not going to play devil's advocate. This is far too important for that. And I look forward to a lively discussion. Thanks.